When you're in practice, sometimes a client will want to have an initial consultation with a lawyer before they either side decides whether the representation will continue. And this could be by phone or video chat or in person. Some firms, in fact, advertise that they don't charge for an initial consultation. When the lawyer meets with a prospective client, it could be an ind one or more individuals or a corporate entity that basically has a person from that entity, whether a manager or general counsel, who's going to talk to the lawyer. Now, a lot of crucial information is shared during an initial consultation because each side is still trying to decide what to do and whether to proceed. So the one party may be trying to decide if they have a valid claim and also if they really want to hire this lawyer or if they can afford this particular firm. And the lawyer, in turn, still has to probably do a conflicts of interest check and may still decide that they don't really think this client or this type of case is a good fit for their firm. In either case, it's pretty common that you, after an initial consultation, no representation ensues. And we have some ethics rules that will not apply because no client-lawyer relationship was created in that type of case. But there are still some duties of confidentiality about that information that's shared in a private conversation with a lawyer by someone who's at least seeing if they could get legal representation, and also some duties of loyalty. And Model Rule 1.18 really covers these situations. And then we have a couple of ABA formal ethics opinions that add cl some clarification of the terms and phrases in Rule 1.18. So having said that, let's dive in. 1.18a starts with just a definition section. We're going to call these people prospective clients, a person who consults with a lawyer about the possibility of forming a client-lawyer relationship with respect to a matter is a prospective client. B says that even when no client-lawyer relationship ensues, a lawyer who has learned information from a prospective client shall not use or reveal that information, except as Rule 1.9 would permit with respect to the information of a former client. So even this first, though this person is not a former client because they never become a client, we're going to incorporate by reference the basically duties about information, confidential information, from Model Rule 1.9, which is about former clients. Moving on, C. A lawyer is subject to paragraph B. In other words, client shared some confidential information that's material to the matter, shall not represent a client with interests materially adverse to those of a prospective client um, in the same or substantially related matter if the lawyer received information from the prospective client that could be significantly harmful to that person in the matter, except as provided in paragraph D, which is going to be our exception. So keep in mind that a lawyer could be, because they did a consultation, even if either the client decided not to hire that lawyer or the lawyer didn't want to take the case, the lawyer could be precluded from representing some other clients in the same matter or even a substantially related matter. It goes on, Section C, and says, if a lawyer is disqualified under this paragraph, no lawyer in the firm with which that lawyer is associated may knowingly undertake or continue representation in such a matter, except as provided in paragraph D, which is going to be our big exceptions to this. In other words, the whole firm would be disqualified from representing the opposing party in the same or a closely related matter. Okay, let's keep going to D. And here's our first basic exception, and this is consent. If the lawyer has received disqualifying information as defined in paragraph C, representation will be permissible if both the affected client and a prospective client have given informed consent confirmed in writing. When you have a question about this on the MPRE, if it's about someone who came in for a consultation and there was no other contact between them and the lawyer, Make sure you check in that question if it says in passing that the client gave consent um, to the con uh, um, to the lawyer representing another party with materially adverse interests. Um, D continues, and uh, part two is a little more complicated. Let's say the lawyer who received the information took reasonable measures 
to avoid exposure to more disqualifying information than was reasonably necessary to determine whether to represent the prospective client and the disqualified lawyer is timely screened from any participation in the matter and as a portion no fee therefrom and written notice is probably given to the prospective client. So in other words, this is going to sound like 1.9 and 1.10 for screening. If one lawyer in a firm does a consultation, they get just enough information, let's say that they can know what the case is kind of about and they can check for conflicts of interest. They realize that that either they don't want to hire the client, uh, uh, represent the client, or that they have a conflict. Um, If we can screen that lawyer, and then we don't need consent because we can just give notice to the affected prospective client. Now, I'm going to hit a few of the highlights from the ABA's comments to this rule that I think are useful to know for purposes of answering multiple choice test questions on my exam or on the MPRE. First, um, let's t- say we have a scenario where a lawyer solicits information publicly, like through their website or an advertisement, or maybe in person, but it's often through an, a lawyer's website. So somebody goes to a website, they say, do you have a legal question? And then there's a form that they want you to fill out where you're supposed to describe your uh, problem or what you would want representation for, and maybe even attach relevant documents. Well, if you do that, whether the lawyer ever talks to you about what you said, You've provided the firm with with crucial information, and so that's going to count as a consultation, even if the lawyer doesn't have a consultation with you, a live consultation, or maybe they call you to schedule an appointment and you change your mind because you've already hired another firm. In other words, 1.18 will apply in that situation. In contrast, let's say a consultation does not occur if a person provides the information in response to an advertising to advertising that merely describes a lawyer's education, experience, areas of practice, contact information, and general legal information of general interest. In other words, if you just have an ad like the one pictured here, and you send a lawyer an unsolicited email saying, hey, here's all the personal details about my case, and here's some attachments. Well, the lawyer didn't really ask for that. There was no reason for you to think that you could rely on confidentiality in that case. And in that case, the lawyer, frankly, would be free to represent the opposing party in the matter because it was all on you that you sent all of this information to a lawyer unsolicited without knowing if the lawyer was even willing to meet with you. Um, Also, a lawyer could condition a consultation with a prospective client on the person's informed consent that no information disclosed during the consultation will prohibit a lawyer from representing a different client in the same matter. In, in other words, if you aren't really sure, you could just ask the client um, if they're willing to consent to this before you ever meet with them, before they tell you anything. And that type of um, c- consent will be uh, effective as long as they were informed about the consequences of it before they talk to you. Comment 5 um, says that uh, if expressly provided, a prospective client may also consent to the lawyer's subsequent use of information received from the prospective client. And so let's say you have someone come in for a consultation and like right off the bat, you realize that, well, I don't really want to represent this person. They're not going to be able to afford our firm's fees, or we consistently represent defendants, or we always represent plaintiffs, something like that. And so you realize before that much information is shared that you're not going to want to represent this person. Your firm won't. You could ask, there's no harm in asking if they would willing be willing for to consent to you representing another party in the matter if um, you don't continue with them. And if they agree, then you can. Now, a lot of individuals wouldn't do this, but maybe an insurance company or a bank, it would. Probably the person they have talking to you is pretty savvy. They do a lot of consultations with different firms. They may be shopping around uh, to pick the best firm, and so they may not care. Comment six says that even without an agreement, a lawyer may represent a client with interests adverse to those of a prospective client in the same or substantially related manner um, uh, unless a lawyer has received from the prospective client information that could be significantly harmful if used in the matter. And so, in other words, if 
you met with a client and right away they said, you're going to represent me for free, right? I, I, or you're going to do this pro bono and you say no, and that's the end of the consultation. Well, you didn't get any information that would trigger the application of 1.18, in which case you could turn right around and represent one, the opposing party in the matter. Comment seven is about the imputation issue. The prohibition in this rule, as we said, is imputed to other lawyers in the firm is the same as with Rule 1.10. But imputation can be avoided if the lawyer obtains informed consent confirmed in writing of both the prospective and affected client. So that's one way around this. And Rule 1.18, this is from an ethics opinion in 2020, number uh, opinion 492. Rule 1.18 uh, prohibits accepting a new matter if the lawyer received information from a prospective client that could be significantly harmful in the new matter. Note that that condition is a little bit, uh, is a phrase that's different between this rule and rule 1.9. Um, what is significantly harmful information? Well, they give several examples of things that you should just assume count. So um, the person talks about their views on settlement issues, like how much they would settle for or how quick, uh, how much of a hurry they're in to settle and so forth information relating to civil or criminal liability. So the person admits fault or something like that during the consultation, um, personal accounts of relevant events or the client, prospective client's strategic thinking about how to manage the situation. Um, a 20 minute phone conversation, in which the client outlines all the potential claims against the, that they might have against the other party and the amount needed that they would require to settle. That obviously is a lot of information and would preclude you from representing the other party in the matter if you don't end up proceeding with this client. Um, here's another example that they give in Opinion 492, a presentation by a prospective corporate client um, about the underlying facts and legal theories of its proposed lawsuit. So they go into detail, they explain their theory of the case and the facts that would support it and so forth. That's enough for Rule 1.18 to apply. Sensitive personal information in a divorce case, a prospective client's financial information, and again, possible terms or structure of a proposed bid to acquire a corporation. So if the, they're looking at it, maybe a merger or acquisition, and they go into some details about how to structure the deal, that's kind of the same as talking about a theory of the case. Remember that there's some situations where there are no duty, the duties, like someone contacts a lawyer with the, in bad faith, the intent to disqualify their lawyer from representing other parties in the matter, well, then there would be no, the courts have found that there's no real duty under 1.18. So you have a husband and it's a small town. So the husband knows that his wife is going to file divorce. So the husband goes around and does consultations with every divorce lawyer in town, hoping to disqualify them. Well, if it becomes clear during the disqualification hearing that the party seeking disqualification acted in bad faith and scheduled consultations in to intentionally to disqualify other firms and make it harder for the opposing party to get counsel, courts are going to hold that against the party that did it. Um, and the, uh, one point, this ethics rule says that they should, the ABA came out in 2020 and says that should um, be disqualifying for the party that's seeking to disqualify a firm. Sometimes intellectual property um, the plaintiffs will do this as well in patent cases, for example. Um, also, as we said, unilateral transmission, unsolicited transmission to a lawyer does not create a Rule 1.18 duty. And then they give an example. An attorney undertook, this is from an old ethics opinion, I'm sorry, in 1990, opinion uh, 358. Let's say an attorney undertook representation of a client in a breach of contract claim, started to work on the matter, a few weeks later, the opposing party in the litigation consulted with another lawyer in the same firm about the same matter. But in the consultation, they disclosed no confidential information that really mattered except the identity of the other party um, and the nature of the claim. Well, when the second lawyer did a routine conflicts check, they quickly discovered that this conflict with the new prospective client, they're already representing the opposing party and immediately declined to represent them. The lawyer and the attorney already representing the first client discuss the situation. So here's a question that the ABA answers. May the attorney tell his client, to the, right, the, the opposing party that they're already representing, you're not going to believe who came in for a consultation. 
And the answer is no, not unless the uh, uh, the prospective client consents. In other words, you have to keep it confidential that they even came in for a consultation. Um, you can continue to represent the client if the attorney does not use any information gleaned from the other party's consultation against them. And that concludes our little lecture about ABA Model Rule 1.18.